Hi there, so this is our project for EEE 135. We are doing flywheels as green energy storage alternatives. I'm Justin Ellis. I'm Houston Garnier. And here we're going to go. So right now we looked into uh, four different ways that energy is stored. One of the four is electrochemical, as you can see below, which breaks up into batteries, flow batteries, and hydrogen. We also did electromagnetic, which breaks up into electric and magnetic. Uh, thermodynamically, which breaks into multiple categories. Uh, one of them is pressure. Pressure and heat we uh, considered one, and then as heat. And then there is also mechanically, which would be what we're going to study more on, which is kinetic with flywheels. And then there's also gravity that can be used to store energy. There is also a fifth one that is currently being developed, which would be biologically, which we saw in our solar system, which they're working with, uh, doing with chlorophyll and ways like that. Good. So the first topic we'll be discussing is uh, under electrochemical, which will be hydrogen fuel cells. And looking at the graph, uh, you can see how we sp it's split up by an electrolyte. Hydrogen would be what the fuel is going in, and oxygen would be the air going in. And the way it works is when the at the anode, a catalyst separates the hydrogen molecule into protons and electrons and forces the electrons go through the electric uh, or current or circuit that we have above, and then it'll go down to the cathode. Uh, right now, hydrogen fuel cells are not a very promisable way to use uh, energy storage, uh, given that they're very expensive, and they also require the use of high-pressure loops. Um, they also have uh, large uh, CO2 outputs that we'd rather avoid. So the second part of electrochemical we studied into was batteries. This is the most common used one that we have right now. There's lithium ion, we have lithium, uh, we have lead acid, we have nickel cadmium, and although batteries are getting um, more popular, they're still popular, but they're getting better. We are able to make rechargeable batteries now. Uh, the problem with uh, batteries is that they're still hazardous and they're still dangerous to the environment. However, they're the best method we have for storing power for a long, uh, long period of time, generate, and they generate power by using a chemical medium as an electrolyte to create a channel for electrons to flow when uh, connected to a load. So the next form we have is the first kind of electromagnetic energy storage we're going to talk about, and this is supercapacitors. So this is a phrase that we've been using to describe capacitors with very high capacitance values. Um, they're much larger plates inside that are closer together in a parallel plate configuration. Um, they contain a porous substance that allows them to capture more electrons than in a normal capacitor. This obviously increases the cost of these. Uh, the capacitance range for these could be anywhere from thousands of farads to tens of thousands of farads. Unfortunately, with these higher capacitance values, the voltage per capacitor is very low. So to use uh, supercapacitors for energy storage devices requires large banks, which again increase the cost of the energy storage system. So the next form of electromagnetic energy storage we're going to talk about is superconducting magnetic energy storage, also known as SMES. It utilizes a superconducting wire and a magnet to store a current sent into the wire. So essentially it creates a large inductor and would be the inductor version of a supercapacitor. The wire is super cool to lower the resistance, often done with liquid nitrogen, and that is so you can keep the most energy stored in that wire and the least amount lost as heat. The energy is stored in a magnetic field and can be discharged when needed. Again, just how an inductor works is how this thing works, and you can see from this diagram that you're using a uh, helium nitrogen mix, which requires a huge amount of energy for, to produce liquid nitrogen, running the wire through a refrigerator to keep it super cooled. And the downside of this is that the amount of area required to store large amounts of energy for a plant that would be one gigawatt hour would require 100 miles of inductive loop. So the next energy storage system we have is a thermodynamic system. We're using compressed air energy storage. So as you can see from the picture, it's often done in depleted oil reserves or gas reserves where there's already a crater that is pretty airtight in the earth. Um, how the system works is that ambient air is compressed into that cavern when there's excess energy created by either solar or wind or renewable energy of any kind. The energy is then stored there in a way that as pressure and when you need power it can be pumped out into a turbine to produce energy in off-peak hours for renewables. 
it's very similar to a hydro pump system. Again, you're using the excess energy that you have created and using that to store energy using pressure or gravity or whatever. Unfortunately, pressure can be lost in the cracks in the ground, just depending on earth movements or other things. And it's not very efficient because to get optimum output, you have to heat the air as it's leaving, which requires a heat source, which is, again, energy lost. So the uh, first form of mechanical that we'll be covering is pumped hydro. And the way we do this is when we have excess energy, again, from renewable sources, or we would just pump that water up uh, into an upper reservoir. And then when we need that energy, we can just send it back down to the turbine uh, when we're on like off-peak hours when we need more power. Uh, it uses a reversible pump turbine motor generator assembly to pump water and acts as a turbine when it needs power. Problem is that's a uh, high cost and you can only work in a certain location. It also has environmental hazards that are potential and it takes a lot of energy to pump uh, the water up, which is again a lot of energy losses. So all of these systems have a lot of drawbacks that we'd like to avoid. Um, fuel cells, they're poor storage size, they are very high cost. Battery systems, they have very short uh, lifetime and they also are very environmentally hazardous. Um, the battery, set, uh, battery systems also, if there's any problems with it, we have to completely redo the system. We can't just take certain parts out of it. Supercapacitors would need large banks in order to be useful, and they have, since, because they have very low voltage and the very high cost. The superconducting magnetic energy storage system is very impractical due to the um, need for liquid nitrogen in order to free, uh, flash freeze our wire in order to lower the resistance, and it also needs a very large area, so we can't really use that. <laughs> Uh, the CAES um, requires specific areas, and they would be very difficult due to the high heat that we need to um, use in order to actually use the push the air out into our uh, turbine. And the pumped hydro system can only work in specific areas, so they're not very viable energy systems, except for batteries and potentially fuel cells if we get better technology. So that brings us to the mechanical energy storage system that we're going to be discussing, which is flywheels. Uh, here is a picture of Beacon Power's flywheel system that they are using in multiple sites that we're going to discuss later. So what flywheels do is they store energy. They're very cost efficient in terms of energy storage per weight as well as energy storage per dollar. And for maintenance, it's very low for a flywheel and the parts are modular and can be replaced. They have low losses, as you can see from this image the flywheel is placed in a vacuum chamber to reduce any environmental negatives that could happen and they're less harmful and dangerous to both the environment and the end user. So here we have a very basic diagram of a basic flywheel system. You have a motor with power coming in that is creating rotational force on the flywheel. The flywheel begins spinning and then when power is required the generator can take that rotational energy and produce electric energy on the output. Okay. So you can look at our uh, data here. It's with a steel cylinder and uh, with a radius of 10 inches, a thickness of 5 inches, and a total weight of 454 pounds. And we can see that as we increase the RPM of our flywheel, we increase the power that we uh, would be able to output. And this is based on the equation where energy is equal to uh, the mass times the radius squared times the angular velocity squared uh, divided by 2. And also, we have multiplied by a K factor, which is based on the geometry of our flywheel. And we found that the geometry of the flywheel plays a very important role. Whether we use a disc or a ring cylinder, it depends on how much output we'll get out of it. And looking at our data, you can see uh, the relationship and how the power gra uh, exponentially rises as we increase the RPM. So battery storage systems are the most commonly used today. They use different chemistries for different purposes. Batteries are dangerous if they're poorly serviced and pose a threat to starting fires. And recycling batteries also is very hazardous. It's very expensive. Uh, there's toxic chemicals involved inside of the battery. And it's not environmentally safe. Many batteries are just dumped or thrown in landfills when they're past their usable period. So flywheels have a definite safety advantage over batteries. They only store energy when they're spinning, and so they're very predictable. Also, as you can see from the previous diagrams, most flywheels today used in commercial purposes are placed in vacuum chambers. So that creates a big separation between the user and the flywheel itself. 
So compared to battery storage systems, flywheel, which are uh, more difficult to fully discharge because of the chemical nature of the batteries, it's very hard to get zero voltage coming out of them, whereas the flywheel, you can just stop the rotation. Uh, the battery involves dangerous chemical reactions. Again, the flywheel is just simply a rotating piece of material. And battery systems require expertise to examine and service internal components. With a flywheel, there's not very many components really to deal with that are require any expertise. You just have bearings, which may be either mechanical or they can be magnetic, and you have a rotating mass. So when it comes down to which energy storage option that is chosen, cost efficiency is one of the major deciding factors. So a flywheel system consists of only mechanical parts, as we said. They're very cheap to maintain and service because it's very modular. There's multiple different components in a flywheel, but they're all separate, a motor, a rotor, and bearings, and they can all be replaced independently and not require replacement of any other parts, whereas a battery has to be replaced as an entire unit. And they last uh, substantially longer than conventional energy storage systems. As we'll talk about later, many commercial flywheels are rated for 30 years or more of service. So one of the uh, ways we can implement a flywheel is using a renewable energy storage system. When we have a solar system at home, uh, you might want to store power for after hours when it starts to get dark, you could have a flywheel. So we found that around 17.87 kilowatt hours is used in a average California home and 5.8 kilowatt hours is from five to nine, which is about 33% of your daily usage. And given that five to nine uh, during most times of the year is gonna be when the sun's going down and you won't be getting as much power output, your flywheel will be able to pick up that uh, slack for you. So uh, the main benefit to having uh, your flywheel in your home is to isolate yourself from the grid a bit and it can reduce your household bill during that five to nine period since that's your biggest output of, like, out of energy just for a short period of time. Your flywheel will be able to pick up that slack for you. You won't have to pay the utility company to supply that power for you. And another benefit that we could have is you could package this with a solar system that way you have a really good renewable energy storage system alongside your solar system that you already have in your household. So there are a few large scale flywheel energy storage sites that are uh, currently in operation. They're both by Beacon Power and the first is in Steventown, New York. It's a 20 megawatt plant and it's used for frequency regulation in the New York ISO. So frequency regulation is that this plant is a large scale plant that produces a very consistent 60 hertz and can be introduced to the grid to provide regulation. So it reached full output in June of 2011. There are 200 flywheels, each capable of 100 kilowatts, which produces the 20 megawatts total. And they all go through 3,000 to 5,000 full depth of discharge cycles every year. Their second site, which was opened more recently, is in Hazel Township, Pennsylvania. It's also a 20 megawatt frequency regulation plant, also has 200 flywheels, completed in July of 2014. This system is connected directly to the 69 kV system for their local utility. Each flywheel can provide 100 kilowatts of output for 15 minutes, which means it can store 25 kilowatt hours. They can fully respond to uh, energy need in four seconds and each flywheel is rated for 150,000 full discharge cycles, which if you take that and divide by the maximum 5,000 full depth of discharge cycles per year, then you get the 30 year total rated uh, time. So one of the main uses for a uh, flywheel that we saw besides using it for an energy storage device in the home uh, is for voltage sag regulation. And voltage sag or voltage dip is when there's a small drop in the RMS voltage on a transmission line. And this constantly occurs through all transmission lines and it's usually an unavoidable uh, problem. Right now we use battery regulators in order to restore that lost voltage, but batteries don't have an instantaneous discharge and flywheels would be able to resolve that problem. These voltage sags usually last uh, for usually half a cycle to one minute if they're very bad and they have a drop from 10 to 90% of its nominal voltage uh, that we could hopefully avoid by using a flywheel. So as I said, the batteries are currently used for voltage regulation and one of the problems is that they're very high cost in order to get a system set up. 
and they also have very high maintenance in order to make sure any problems that happen, you have to restore the entire system and get a whole new system set up. Flywheels, any part that breaks apart, you just get a new piece and put it into the flywheel. Uh, the lifespan for these battery banks are usually around 5 to 10 years compared to our 30 years that we were seeing in, in flywheels. Um, the problem with batteries also is that, again, they release hazardous hydrogen gas and become very difficult to dispose, um, especially these large types of banks used for va uh, voltage sag and voltage regulation. So the current drawbacks of flywheels that we can see is due to the nature of how they store energy, they must be a static element. If you go back to the pictures that you saw on the Hazel Township and Steventown, New York, you can see that the flywheel systems are actually placed in the ground in concrete bases, and that keeps the entire assembly from moving and free from any parasitic oscillations from vibration. Uh, size determines the storage capability, which leads to space limitations. Again, as you can see from those previous examples, they're on large plots of land. Each one of the shipping containers next to the flywheel systems are 40 feet long. So you can use that as a relative image on how large these sites are. As of now, they would not be able to power small mobile electronics. So obviously, you're based on whatever you can power by a flywheel is based on how much room you have to put the flywheel in. And they're potentially limited to large-scale industry, obviously, because the size of the system is going to determine what kind of energy you use. So We've presented some ways that can be used for residential, but as of now, there's no systems on the market that you can just buy and have delivered to your door to use for energy storage as a replacement for a battery backup in your solar system. So if you look back at our second slide, you can see that we had four different ways to store energy. We had electrochemical, electromagnetic, thermodynamic, and mechanically. They all have their uh, benefits and drawbacks, but we found that flywheels were probably one of the best ways to go about in the future to store energy and we saw that it can be used for voltage regulation and voltage sag we can implement it into maybe a small scale residential home for the five to nine uh, p uh, period and that if right now it's already a really good use in large-scale industry in order to help uh, power areas in, uh, in New York and in Philadelphia Pennsylvania and lastly, here are two slides showing the references that we used in our research.